This convention establishes genocide as an international crime which signatory nations undertake to prevent and punish. And that's really important. So what is genocide? Most of us are aware that it's a mass murder of some form, but the definition covers any one of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, <coughs> ethnic, racial or religious group by killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. But the reality is that since the UN Convention came into effect, <coughs> several genocides have been witnessed around the world. Some of the recent high-profile examples include the Central African Republic, Syria, Darfur, and Rwanda. And there are arguably others, including Palestine. But there is also a horrific example which took place almost on our doorstep. In Europe. The crime of these individuals, the mark which caused them to be targeted, was that they were Muslim. Bosnia is in southeastern Europe. It's bordered by Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro. The region has always been ethnically and religiously diverse. However, following the death of the dictator Tito in 1980, there was a power vacuum, and the plane was fertile for the power-hungry Slobodan Milosevic, with his mantra of nationalist rhetoric and hate. In 1989, he became the president of Serbia. His vision? an ethnically pure, Serbian-dominated state. The people in Bosnia-Herzegovina watched in horror as violence and, chaos fled, uh, violence and chaos fled in the north during the early 1990s. Like non-Serbs in Croatia and Slovenia, the non-Serbs in Bosnia were nervous about the repercussions of a Serb-dominated federation. Unlike its neighbours, there were significant minority populations in Bosnia. 43% were Bosniak Muslims, 35% were Orthodox Serbs, and 18% were Roman Catholic Croats. Turning to the Western diplomatic world for help, leaders in Bosnia were urged to hold a referendum on the issue of independence from the Republic. In March 1992, Bosnians, minus the Serbs who had been urged to boycott the vote by Milosevic, and the Serbian nationalists overwhelmingly chose accession. Violence broke out almost immediately. Bosnian Serbs began arresting and executing leaders amongst the Bosnian and Croat communities. The small Bosnian army added 80,000 armed and well-trained soldiers to its ranks from the departing Yugoslav National Army. However, the UN had enacted an arms embargo that left the Bosnians and Croats without weapons to defend themselves. And these acts started violence, displacement, and death that lasted the next three years. The most famous example of massacre in Bosnia is that of Srebrenica, a Bosniak-dominated town under UN protection, and we'll hear more about that today. In July of 1995, the Serb general, Ratko Mladic, marched into Srebrenica and separated the men and women from the children and murdered approximately 8,000 Bosniak men, the single largest massacre in Europe since World War II. For those not killed in the initial massacres, many were sent to one of 381 concentration or detention camps in Bosnia, inhumane living conditions, beating, torture, and mass execution. And this all happened as the world watched. The international world was watching whilst this was happening. Samantha Power, author of a book called A Problem from Hell, said no other atrocity campaign in the 20th century was better understood and monitored by the US government than the Bosnian genocide. However, despite the wealth of information and irrefutable evidence of genocide, the US government under both Presidents Bush and Blink uh, Clinton initially chose isolationist policies citing the lack of U.S. interests at stake in the conflict. So that's a bit 
bit to set the scene about what we'll be talking about today. We have three speakers who will uh, talk a bit about Bosnia and about genocide in general. Um, I'll introduce the first speaker, who is Dr. Babar Azmi. He is chairman of the Waterhouse Consulting Group, a charita, um, and a charitable initiative called Remembering Srebrenica, set up to commemorate the Srebrenica genocide. Bagar has played a significant role in public life on a national and international scale. He was previously the UK government's chief diversity advisor at the Cabinet Office and the European Union ambassador for intercultural dialogue. He has also served as a member of the Oldham Riots Inquiry, which was set up to investigate the riots that occurred in May 2001. So over to the part. Thanks, um, uh, Salma, for that um, most generous uh, introduction. Um, when you introduce like that, you, I tend to sort of, um, <clears throat> try and you know, look back and see, you know, whether the chair is introducing someone else, really, because you don't recognize yourself. It seems so consistent, um, uh, you know, with your biography, what you've achieved, really. Um, and it's never like that. But thank you for that most generous uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, at uh, City Circle, this is my first, um, and it's a great honor for me to be uh, able to speak uh, to you uh, for a few minutes. I'm not a, the main speaker, the main speakers are Adam Boys, um, and I'm sure the chair will introduce Adam shortly, who is a very eminent um, uh, figure uh, in this field, and we're very honored that Adam has been able to uh, be with us here today. And the survivor, um, of Srebrenica, Mohamed Rakvich. Uh, it is an honor for uh, Mohamed to be uh, with us here today. This is a, a series of lectures which Remembering Srebrenica as a charity has organized. Um, two days ago we had a lecture at Royal Holloway uh, on this topic. Yesterday we had a lecture at the House of Lords uh, and today we're here at City Circle. It's part of the initiative from Remembering Srebrenica. You all have a copy of the book, which we published um, 20,000 copies, which are going to schools, to different uh, institutions across the country, um, uh, as well as parliamentarians to raise awareness. Um, that is one aspect of the charity, uh, and in terms of raising awareness, it isn't just about the distribution of books or um, having public lectures, uh, but also about um, working with government and schools, the unions, the teach, uh, teacher unions, uh, to include Srebrenica uh, as part of the charisma. I think for me, uh, being chairman of Remembering Srebrenica, and those of you who are in this audience who are as old as I am, will remember the horrors uh, that we watched on our television, that we couldn't believe that this was something which was happening before our eyes when the whole world has said never again after the second after, uh, after the Holocaust. That this was happening and happening in front of our eyes, in, in our living rooms, day in, day out, where between twenty to fifty thousand women were raped across and uh, we're talking about Sabrinisa today, but also the policy of ethnic cleansing that took place across the whole of Bosnia, where they look at different areas of Visegrad, or where they look at uh, areas of Priodor, etc., where the ethnic cleansing policy to ethnically eliminate a particular group because of their religious identity uh, is something which is just unbearable. And it affected a lot of us in this country as well as across the world in different ways. For me, it affected so much that I devoted my life uh, to um, to tackling hatred and racism. I left academia, at that time I was a lecturer at what is now Southampton Solent University. Um, I was a lecturer of politics, I left and became chief executive of Worcestershire Racial Equality Council, and ever since then my life has been devoted to fighting racism and equality, and, and promoting equality. Um, the second aim is to hold Serenity Memorial Day. Last year we held the first Memorial Day in the UK at Lancaster House, uh, where we brought four survivors and I took them to meet the Prime Minister on 11th of July and then after that the survivors spoke at Lancaster House at the memorial event where Foreign Secretary William Hague, William Hague uh, Lord Paddy Ashton from the Liberal Democrats, uh, Hillary Benn from the Liberal Party, the uh, 
Shadow Secretary of State um, uh, for Communities, uh, as well as leader of the Scottish National Party in Westminster, uh, Angus Robertson, uh, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, um, spoke. The reason I'm mentioning all these names is simply to say that Remembering Serbonese's aim has been to bring all politicians together, all faith leaders together and communities together because this is, isn't about any political issue or religious issue. This is beyond politics, beyond religion, this is about humanity. Where children were murdered last year, five, just under 500 people, bodies were found. And one of those bodies was of a child uh, who would have been 18 um, last year. Do you think that such humanity can take place in our time? that such atrocities, the darkest moment since the Second World War in Europe. Yet, we see that people have forgotten Srebrenica. That there isn't any initiative to remember. Uh, the European Parliament passed a resolution in 2009 asking every member state to commemorate 11th of July as Srebrenica Memorial Day. And no country has done that, except us here in the UK. We're the first country to, um, to establish Srebrenica Memorial Day. I'm pleased to say that this year, we're holding three national events, if I can use that term. One in England, uh, which will be on 8th of July at Lancaster House. Another one in Wales, which will be on 9th of July. And the third one in Scotland, which will be on 11th of July. So three national memorial days, uh, several memorial days, and 30 local events across the cities, different towns. And we want, next year with the 20th anniversary, that we would want, and this is our uh, vision, this is what we want to work towards, we want um, um, if not all cities and towns, but at least um, you know, a couple of hundred cities and towns to be commemorating Severus and Memorial Day. And the reason is, is so that we learn lessons from the past to create a better future. The reason is so that we preserve the memory of what happened and we pass that on to the next generation. The reason is so that we learn and we teach our children that the consequences of hatred can be something gruesome. One thing that really stuck and has always been in my heart is when I first went to Srebrenica and Bosnia, and those of you who have been will share this. The, in the, the dictionary of Bosnian language, multiculturalism didn't exist. One race, one color, they're all white. And you see people with blonde hair, blue eyes. And people say to me in this country, and I've been in the race equality field for a very long time, people say to me, the problem is that people aren't integrated. If people get integrated, then you have no problems. Well, in Bosnia, there's no better example of integration. Not just integration, but assimilation. Where under the communist regime, regime people were assimilated. There was no religion as such. Assimilation is what existed. Yet, people kill them, each other because of um, hatred, because of uh, someone's uh, religion. And if that could happen to a country where assimilation was promoted, assimilation existed, integration was at, at its highest, what is the future of our country where there is this diversity, where multiculturalism does exist in our dictionary, in our, in our language, where we use it daily? where there are people of different color, people of different religion, people who dress differently, and yet there are organizations who are promoting hatred, who are promoting extremism. So the importance of being vigilant, learning lessons from the past to create a better and safer future for all is critical. So that is the, the second aim, which is um, commemoration. So we bring leaders together, so they're engaged with this subject, and that they help to tackle um, hatred in whatever shape or form that exists. The third aim is to take lessons from Srebrenica visits. So we take education programs, we have established a number of delegates have gone to Srebrenica and people just don't go and visit. So there's a whole program um, that exists. The condition is that people go, they're recommended um, by various organizations, for example Mosaic or uh, the Princess Trust as well as other organizations and uh, we would welcome City Circle to also make recommendations is that people make pledge, a pledge to come back and do something in return. So the 30 local events that's happening uh, across the cities and towns are done by 
those delegates who've been to Srebrenica who've come back and doing that in a voluntary capacity. And they are preserving the memory. Uh, and there's a number of other things that they're doing to raise awareness uh, and to tackle hatred. That, those three are the aims and objectives of the, the charity. And um, for me, City Circle is an important uh, body, important organization that not only brings professionals together, key people together in London, but it has huge um, potential and huge influence. And people here in this room, that after the presentations, that if people can make commitment that the 11th of July is not far, that you go back and that you do something, however big or small, in return, to raise awareness about suffering, so to preserve the memory, to honor the victims, to honor the mothers. You know, when you meet the mothers, and we're bringing four several sort of, uh, mothers um, this year, you'll hear in terms of what they've gone through, and we can't even imagine what they've gone through. One mother who lost 47 members of her family, totally wiped out, or said to me that last year we wanted her to come and speak at the Memorial Day. She said, I can't because I'm going to be burying my son in Srebrenica, because every year in Srebrenica on 11th of July there's 40,000 people, there's a, um, the bodies are being found, it's still 19 years on, bodies are being found. And Adam will talk about that in terms of how, why is it taking so long and how is it being found. But bodies are being found still 19 years on. And she said to me, don't think that I'm burying my son, they've only found one bone. And I'll be doing janaza on one bone because I really want to put this behind me, on a closure. When you meet mothers, and those are our mothers, you can relate that they could have been our brothers, our sisters who were raped, it really moves you. But the way forward is for us to learn lessons. Learn lessons about the consequences of hatred. Learn lessons that we cannot and must not tolerate hatred in whatever shape or form, extremism in whatever shape or form, this is what it results into. Wherever it exists, we must challenge. And this is what the purpose of remembering Sabrina says. That's what I want to say, um, and I will now pass on to the chair to introduce the next uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, for 20 years since he was sent to Bosnia by the British charity Feed the Children in 1994. Adam then joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, and was seconded to the International Conference on the former Yugoslavia mission in Montenegro and Serbia. From 1996 to 2000, Adam worked for the Office of the High Representative in Sarajevo as a Chief Administrative Officer and later as a uh, Director of Finance. Adam joined the International Commis Commission for Missing Persons in 2000 and held the position of Chief Operating Officer until December of last year. And in January of this year, the Chairman appointed him to the position of Director of International Programme. Adam. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. And, and I'm very grateful both to City Circle, but also to Dr. Wakar Asmi for, for um, incorporating International Commission on Missing Persons into this, into these presentations. The the history of uh, uh, the, the the history of my organisation is uh, is really a reflection, effectively, of the international community's response to what happened at Srebrenica. Um, so. I'm going to take you through some slides and um, just to, to sort of try to introduce this concept to you. The, uh, in a sense, what the International Com Commission on Missing Persons was really about was a response to a failure. Uh, the United Nations, the international community's um, actions in Bosnia and Herzegovina certainly constituted a failure. And in fact, it's been described what happened with the United Nations in Srebrenica itself 
has been described as complicity with evil. So the what uh, what happened after the failure uh, of the um, of the United Nations to protect people in Srebrenica was that uh, the international community had to react more strongly. And Bill Clinton, uh, President Clinton, took a massive political gamble to put troops on the ground in Bosnia. Uh, this is an extremely unpopular thing within his own country. And he had to reach across the aisle to Bob Dole, the senator that he just defeated in the presidential elections, to, to help him get enough uh, political capital to allow them to do this. But the critical point was that they couldn't bring American troops home in body bags. So they wanted to get out of Bosnia as soon as possible. And he looked for diplomatic political initiatives that could possibly uh, limit the, um, the amount of time that, Bosnia, uh, that the troops were there by improving the uh, chances for peace. So ICMP was really a political initiative. It was established by Clinton and, and uh, it involved very senior uh, people, including, for example, Lord Carrington, uh, Shabzada Yaqub Khan, the foreign minister from uh, Pakistan, and a number of other very, very high-level people who would come in and they would talk to leaders in the region. They would say, where are the missing? What's happened to them? Tell us what, what, the, what their fate is. A lot of the time they thought that they were in centers of a uh, hidden detention, uh, but we already knew then that very large numbers of people had been killed and had disappeared. However, that initiative did lead to a lot of information a lot of mass graves were uncovered. And when the particular focus came to Srebrenica, what we realized was that there was no chance that we could identify the people in the graves. And one of the classic defenses in the war crimes tribunal was, well, you can't actually tell who was in the grave, so it could be anybody, it could be any ethnicity. It could be Serbs, it could be Croats, it could be people from the Second World War. So um, we're not going to accept that this is evidence of a war crime, or at least from this conflict. Also, there was a very human dimension. Every time a grave was opened, the mothers, the families would turn up and look in and say, well, have you found evidence of my son? There was no capacity to identify him. Another thing that I think is important to remember, and one thing that, um, that it's extremely important to keep two things separated. One is that there was a very brutal war in Bosnia. There was a conflict. There was uh, uh, who, who started it is, uh, is kind of secondary to the fact that there were a lot of people died, a lot of soldiers died on both sides. And what we're talking about in this context is that there was a policy of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and that policy of ethnic cleansing is essentially the policy of genocide. Um, a, the, head, the president of Genocide Watch, uh, Gregory Stanton, has defined eight uh, levels or, or stages of genocide. I'm not going to focus. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm, I am going to mention each one, but I'm going to focus on three. The first one's classification. That's uh, we all know that that happens. We can you know dust and then. Then there's symbols associated with those things, uh, those classifications. And some of them are very famous. Um, the, the, the gold star uh, affixed to uh, people's clothing in the Second World War, for example. The third stage is dehumanization. That's when the, there's a conscious effort to try to uh, separate people of another group and say, well, they're not really the same as us. They're, they're less than human. And, and I want to quote, this is a quote from Biljana Plavsic, who was the president of the Republic of Serbska in 1994. And uh, she was in, involved in negotiations with, uh, the, there were negotiations on the peace agreement, or what might become the peace agreement. Biljana Plavsic was a biology teacher, uh, originally. So when she said something like this, that, uh, that um, it was a genetically deformed material that embraced Islam. And now, of course, with each successive generation, it simply becomes concentrated. It gets worse and worse. It simply expresses itself and dictates their style of thinking. So, um, this was the head, this was the, the president of the Republic 
Conservative Scout and a scientist, somebody who uh, <coughs> should be in a position to know better. But she's using it very deliberately. Um, the fourth critical stage is organisation. You can't do what was done without involving massive numbers of people. Um, so, and, and one of the things I want to keep picking up on in this presentation is uh, I want you to try to picture how many people would have been involved in each of the stages that we're going to go through. Um, the fifth, sixth, and seven, the polarization of groups, the preparation by identifying where people are, and then extermination. And by this stage, having dehumanized people, it's no longer, uh, it's no longer killing people. And uh, we see that in other contexts. Um, the use of languages, the, the language um, in Bosnia was to start to use la uh, words for Muslims in, in the country which were pejorative, uh, and they became the, the standard words of use. Um, in, in Rwanda, the words locust, for example, um, were, were used to define people. The last stage is denial. And um, as Stanton says, quite ominously, this is amongst the surest indicators of further genocide or massacres. So denial is something that um, our organization tries to, to, to oppose through fact-finding. Uh, and others inv uh, involved in this process, very brave people like Oliver Kahn, the journalist, will stamp on any time he sees any statement that would indicate that uh, someone's trying to question the facts. Now, my computer doesn't like uh, denial for some reason, um, so I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I'm going to try. Um, <coughs> this is a video of a, um, of a man called Stefan Karganovic, and he is, uh, he's paid a lot of money to make statements like the following. Stefan Kargadovic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, graduate of the Indiana University in Law School, uh, and I got interested in Sterling's a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't know very much about it when I started. Uh, I didn't know more than a person, but uh, I thought that I could smell a rat in the official story, and so I simply started researching. But uh, we tried to go through the entire uh, forensic evidence of the Hague Tribunal, which is about three and a half thousand cases, as they call them, although one case does not equal one body. Uh, it turned out when you count the finger bones, which is the most reliable way of figuring out how many people there are in those extravagance related uh, mass graves, it turns out that there were about 1,920. It will take a few. Uh, a victim is only a person who is executed illegally. Uh, battle casualty is not a victim. Uh, it's a casualty. So, uh, we regret the death of every person, but if, you, if we're going to charge people with criminal responsibility for anything, it has to be carefully defined and there has to be evidence to support the charge. There is evidence for a couple of hundred, seven or eight hundred executed prisoners of war, but there is no evidence that I have seen for 8,000. Okay. That is all we are saying. Uh, we don't need just a list of names. That doesn't do the trick, because you can take that out of any telephone directory. What you need is to relate those names to the time, place, and manner of death. Without those three elements, a name doesn't mean a thing. And I am extremely upset that, uh, first of all, uh, there are people who dare to raise this to the level of the real Holocaust uh, during World War II. And also, I am uh, amused by, uh, uh, by their lack of uh, uh, comprehension. Uh, they're not listening, apparently. We have never said anything, we have never taken any position that could be uh, described as genocide denial. In any sense, uh, we do not have any final conclusions about Srebrenica yet. We are still investigating, but at this point, we do not 
feel that we have evidence to conclude that that was an act of genocide, and we certainly do not have evidence that would support the conclusion that 8,000 prisoners of war were executed. That's it. Oh, okay, so um, I, I want to pick up on a couple of the, the points that he said in, uh, in, in, in this statement. And he's, you know, this is a, this is a lawyer. He, he started a, a rather uh, um, a foundation. Um, the, the foundation has a, a, has a dove on the front with a little, you know, an olive branch and, and says it's, Shrubbin, it's a historical project. Um, so it looks very, it looks very in, uh, innocent. It's also, it's got a lot of people who, who talk about themselves as academics uh, and that they're going to research. And he, he, says, um, he, thinks, he says things like, none of the evidence, we went through all the evidence. Uh, we've invited him to come to see what we do. Uh, he's never even responded. Um, he's quite happy to comment about us, uh, our organization. He's quite happy to comment about us personally. Uh, I'm, I'm a stooge of the American government, um, uh, and that I, I'm a native, you know, come from a native country, and therefore I have no balance whatsoever. So, so he, he can go through um, all of this in, in the context of this uh, rather innocent looking um, in this uh, innocent looking project, but actually some of the statements that he makes, while they sound almost reasonable, have to be examined. So, battle casualties are not victims. And that's, that's going to be a crucial thing which I'm going to come back to, because that's part of the defense in these cases. Oh, these are battle casualties. Okay? They're not part of, uh, they're, not, they're nothing to do with uh, a policy, they're not executions, these are, these are battle casualties. Uh, and that... Um, they, they were buried because of essentially a public health issue. You can't have large numbers of people killed in battle. You have to bury them for, for a sanitary reason. The second thing he says, a detailed list of names required. Time, place, and manner of death. Now, they were, these people were put on buses and driven away to fate. But we have no idea what happened to them. How can we know the time, the place, and the manner of death? And uh, the comparison with the Holocaust. Nobody has ever, as far as I know, seriously compared what happened uh, in Srebrenica to the Holocaust. It's a false comparison. It's something that's constantly raised. It's the, the notion of uh, equivalency to diminish uh, what happened. The Srebrenica Historical Project has received a, a million euros from uh, the Republic of Serbska government. Uh, and, and this was recently found out by an opposition politician who, who raised this issue. A million euros in a country, of one, uh, not a country, in part of Bosnia, very poor, one and a half million people, um, less than 25% of the population in employment. So this is an enormous amount of money that's been put in without any transparency into denying what's happened. I'm pleased to say that the Belgrade Book Fair, where he was recorded, uh, banned uh, Stefan Karganovic from, from uh, having a book presentation in their facility and never will allow him again. So that's at least a positive sign. But denial continues. This is a statement by the Milorad Dodik, the current president of Republika Srpska, and this is one of the milder statements that he's made, but he, he continues to uh, say that there was no genocide um, Lots of people escaped. There wasn't a genocide. Uh, these, were, you know, these were casualties of battle. We regret that, but uh, that's what happened. So that's really that's. I, I want to. That's the introduction to the, the concepts of genocide and the particular areas we're going to look at. When it comes to the region of the former Yugoslavia, we're talking approximately forty thousand people who went missing. Now, I'm going to. The difference between going missing and the difference between combat casualties is, is stark. Most of the time, people who died in combat did not also go missing. Missing, in this context, is a policy of forced disappearance. And, in other words, a policy of ethnic cleansing. So the, the number of killed people in Bosnia is d under dispute, but we estimate it's approximately 100 to 110,000. The population of missing persons in Bosnia is about 32,000. 
the population of killed people in combat is more reflective of the ethnic mix of the country. The population of enforced disappearance or ethnic cleansing is all overwhelmingly Bosniak. So when ICMP started working and the International Criminal Court on um, the Tribunal and the Hague started working, we put pressure on governments, we started to get lots and lots of information about the location of mass graves. And we started to exhume them. We started to uncover these mass graves. And this is, this is a chart with the time. You probably can't see it. But on the left-hand side, the scale is the number of cases, the number of uh, remains that, of, of people that we were, found, that we were finding. Uh, finding up to 3,000 people uh, cases a year in a, in a country where there was a there were six pathologists. So it was impossible, absolutely impossible, to do anything in the way of identification. So we had to change uh, the way that we approached this. And I'm going to, the, the point about ICMP is that we believe in the rule of law. This is not about humanitarian identification. Humanitarian identification is rubbish. Uh, humanitarian identification is not what we would expect in our own country. We would not want um, an NGO coming in to help us look for a, a missing relative in this country. We would want the police, we'd want the courts, we'd want to find the person who caused the uh, person to go missing, and we'd want the best forensic science to identify them. So the first stage, and I'll describe what I saw in 1998. Luckily, this has nothing to do with ICMP, this was to do with the way it was done. We're only talking now, uh, 15 years later, um, but that, this is the way that it was done. This is the way it's always been done in post-conflict situations. This is an excavation of a grave called Glumina. And uh, it was a very hot day. It was, not, it was October, um, but it was a, sort of an Indian summer, if you like. Very, very, very warm day, quite humid. And uh, the, the grave had been dug, and the bodies were in thick Yugoslav army uh, nylon bags pulled out of the ground and put on a road uh, next to the gravesite. And then they were opened. And the families were invited to come over and to view the remains in the bags to see if there was anything that they could recognize. Um, incredibly traumatic. Uh, 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 I mean, it destroyed me, and I wasn't related to anyone in the grave. Um, it, it was horrific to see what it did to the families. It was undignified. It was, it was reinforcing what had happened. The attempt to delete a person was then being uh, followed by the undignified way that these people were being treated. And it was also arbitrary. There was no system, there was no rule of law. So these, these secondary victims, the families, uh, were being treated to the same arbitrariness that their loved ones had suffered. So we had to find a different approach. So ICMP's involvement was to say, okay, well, we need to come up with a solution. So we, we stopped being a political organization. We developed an operational capacity. And we said, okay, how are we going to do this? And the first attempt was to say, we'll take some photographs. We took the clothing. Instead of showing the families the, the bodies and the remains, we took the clothing, we laundered it as well as we could. And we laid it out and we took photographs of it uh, and put them into large books that we, we sent out uh, around the country and we showed to 3,000 family members. And uh, 3,000, sorry, families. This is, uh, and we asked them if they could recognize them. And uh, the results were, uh, sorry, I should have said, we took the 800 best cases, the ones we really thought, yep, there's very specific information here that we can use. Of those... 3,000 families, we had 600 reported identifications. This definitely is my son. But of that 600, we had to get rid of 550. Inconsistent with the biological profile, couldn't possibly be that person because of the age. Multiple refer uh, hits on the same person, um, or possibly that they were found in a completely unrelated area. It was impossible to be that person. And then we took the top, the, the, the remaining 50 and we sent them out of the country, out of Bosnia, to do DNA testing, to test the hypothesis, is it this person? And of the 50, we got 26 identifications. So this massive effort to try to identify people. 
uh, resulted in 26 identifications. And what we saw were, was uh, two things. Well, I mean, one, one of the reasons that we had multiple hits was that uh, obviously Srebrenica was uh, the recipient of, of aid coming from Western countries. And lots of the time that was, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 pairs of the same brand of sneakers, 5,000 uh, pairs of the same uh, uh, shirts, uh, T-shirts, etc. So people were not wearing massively different uh, clothing. We also saw two contradictory psychological approaches. One is that people are desperate to find closure. They're really, they're so, they're so, they're so desperate to, to, to know what the fate was that they would, they would say, yes, I'm sure that that's what he was wearing. That exactly reminds me, I guess, I'm sure it was that, it must be that. On the other side, people were unwilling to admit that the person, their loved one has, had died. And they, they, would, they would shy away from recognizing. And I think, you know, the, the first uh, drive is something I've experienced when I was, I was traveling in Nepal and I was, was, I was 18, I was nervous, um, and uh, I was waiting for a friend to come through from China and uh, it was the first time I'd been uh, you know, traveling that far away from home and I was wandering through the streets looking for him. And every Western face that I saw, I would try to morph into this friend's face. And I'd known him since I was three, there's no way I could possibly uh, mistaken, but I was so desperate to find him that I was looking for him in everyone I found. But why was it so difficult? And the, the reason it was so difficult to, to get these identifications was because of the efforts to conceal the remains. Um, what happened was that in uh, 1995, in August 1995, Madeleine Albright went to a Security Council meeting and she and the German representative said, well, we really have, uh, we've, got, we've, we've had overflights of U2 images and satellite images which give us real concern. We think that there has been a massacre. We don't believe that just Srebrenica was overrun, but we believe that something much worse has happened. We're taking reports from the ground of our family members, but we're also detecting that something horrible has happened. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, and unfortunately it's not very clear for you at the back, but this is a sign of a, of a major site, a primary uh, execution site, or murder site. It was corrected on this yesterday. But the, uh, if you, in the middle of the um, area there, you can see some, some dots, whereas the rest of the fields are um, fairly easy to see as being plowed. Those dots are people that have been killed, and they're lying on the ground in a higgledy piggledy fashion. And the road, and the, the sort of temporary roadways are bulldozers that are moving in and taking people and bulldozing them into a, a, a mass grave. <coughs> After Madeleine Albright had given her evidence, um, the information got out and uh, this is a site, this is the same image, the same picture in uh, September of that year. New activity. The grave was being robbed. Uh, the, the, the entire Zvornik mechanized battalion of engineers was De, uh, deployed to uh, dig the grave, to, uh, to dump the um, contents into trucks, all standard <coughs> sizes, and they were driven through the country uh, and dumped into secondary mass graves. This is done at night so that satellite images and oversight wouldn't be, wouldn't be usable. Now, of course, what happens is you've got, you've got bodies that have been in the ground for three months, they've, they've decomposed partially, and they've now been ripped apart in the process of pulling them out of the grave. And it made, that's what really made the identification effort impossible. Uh, anthropological examination was essentially to take out an entire grave and to see whether we could find any identifying information. Uh, and, and to try to match up parts of the grave. So we, we did all sorts of technical um, uh, steps to try to see what we could do to, to reassociate remains, to try to get some kind of identification. But it was impossible. And this is a, an example of um, what happens. This, this man in the middle, and each of these pictures shows the, the cases, the, 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 the back body bags that were taken out from which he was put together. And in each one of the cases, in each skeletal element, his body has been mixed up with the remains of another person. 
simply because of this, this mess of humanity. So at that stage, we said, okay, well, um, we have to try something new. And at, this, at that time, DNA was coming on stream as being something that, was, you know, that could be done more reliably and cost-effectively. But instead of going down the normal route of triangulating down and saying, we find this person in this area, we think it's a male or a female, um, it's probably it's wearing, you know, the body's wearing clothing from this particular era. Um, so we think it's one of these people from this list. Uh, and then you come down all the way to dental records, etc. You get to the person you think it is. And then you test the hypothesis. Is it this person or not? What we said was, uh, forget that. Let's take a reference sample from every single person that is reporting a missing person. Okay? And um, then we'll match it against every set of remains that we find. We'll take a DNA sample from every set of remains. And I call this registering a right because um, the, the families came forward in droves. And this is throughout uh, um, the former Yugoslavia, or this is actually rather throughout Bosnia. When, when it comes to Srebrenica, we're talking about 28,000 people. Uh, gave blood samples. Um, they would come and they would say, okay, we would tell them, look, you give us this information, we will not use it for any other purpose other than identity testing. And we'll protect it. We'll keep it from your governments. We won't let anyone access your genetic material. Um, and, but they found it very empowering. They gave the blood sample and they were able to say, we want to know what happened. So please tell us. Uh, the result was extraordinary. Um, in the first uh, few years, in, 1990, in 1997, 98, 99, uh, and 2000, we saw it was a, literally impossible. All the remains had been taken out of mass graves relating to Srebrenica. They were stored in the hospital. The hospital went on strike because of the numbers. They pushed the, uh, then took the remains and they put them again in a very undignified way in the salt mines in Tuzla and the bodies were attacked by rats it was terrific so in 2001 when we introduced this, uh, this book, the book, the book of photographs we managed to identify 26 people uh, and we had made our first in-country identification using the technique that we had developed, this capturing all of the information and after that it just became completely impossible for uh, anyone to deny what had happened. We started making identifications of literally hundreds of people. In one day, we made 67 identifications of Srebrenica victims, almost three times the number that we'd managed in that exercise using the book of photographs. So when it comes to complex mass graves, this, this man was, was found in four different mass graves. Uh, his body was put together, could only be put together using DNA. But it also allowed us to do one other thing, which was that we started to be able to map the secondary crime, which was the hiding of this evidence, this organized, massive removal of human remains to other places. This, uh, this chart shows the inner um, segments show the primary execution and mass grave sites. If you look at Glogova, for example, these Glogova sites are related to a warehouse called Kravitsa. Some of you saw that when you were in Srebrenica. Um, people were killed at Kravitsa using mach uh, machine guns, using hand grenades. The bodies were then taken out using heavy uh, bulldozing machinery. They were dumped in graves uh, a little bit further down the road. Now we've, we've, we've sort of lost, started losing the trail. We couldn't find where these graves were. So we started to try to work out what was the modus operandi of the perpetrators. What what was behind this, and we mapped what had happened. So we, we were able to say, okay, well, and I hope you can see this, because if you take the top line, Branjevo Farm, uh, I should explain, Gl uh, Glogova is north of Srebrenica, and the distance to Branjevo Farm is how long? 65 so 65 kilometers. So people were driven from Srebrenica, 65 kilometers up to Branjevo Farm. They were killed, they were put into those, uh, into those graves that you saw, and 
and then three months later they were dug and they were brought down the road, and you can't really see it, but in the middle you see these, these round circles, which are the secondary mass graves where these people were, were buried. 